Right. Looks like we've got most everybody accounted for. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Spud Woodward, governor's appointee from Georgia and your current chair of the Atlantic Menhaden Management Board. I uh, appreciate everybody joining for the board meeting today. Um, as if <clears throat> virtual meetings weren't challenging enough, now we have an unpronounceable tropical storm that is rolling across the eastern seaboard. So we will, we will do the best we can. Uh, before uh, I get into uh, the business of the board, I'd like to call on Justin Davis. He'd like to make a brief introduction to the board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Rob LaFrance, who's going to be a new voice for us around the table uh, on the Connecticut side. Um, Rob is going to be serving as the ongoing proxy for our governor's appointee, Bill Hyatt, so I expect he'll be filling in for Bill uh, periodically. Rob is a former employee of our agency, the Connecticut DEP. Uh, he worked as our agency's legislative liaison, and he also worked in our Office of Legal Counsel, uh, during which time he worked really closely with Bureau of Natural Resources programs, including marine fisheries. So essentially, he was our lawyer, and he managed to keep me from doing anything too stupid and getting in trouble, which is no small feat. Um, Rob has since retired from the agency, and he's now serving as an adjunct professor of environmental law at Quinnipiac School of Law and he's also the policy director for Audubon, Connecticut. So welcome, Rob. Thank, thank you, Justin, and, and welcome, Rob. Uh, we, we appreciate you joining us, and uh, look forward to your, your input. Uh, just, I want to provide thank just you. a little thank brief. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Uh, a, little, a little brief overview of our agenda. As you can tell, this will be a split meeting. Uh, we have an hour uh, to do our business this afternoon. Uh, and then we will reconvene tomorrow afternoon at 2.45 to complete our business. So uh, an hour, we've already used up five minutes of our hour, so I'm going to try to keep us moving along pretty quick. Uh, we have uh, an agenda before us. Um, are there any modifications to the agenda? If so, please raise your hand so you can be recognized by Tony. I do not see any hands raised. Uh, uh, no modifications recommended. Uh, I'm going to use uh, consent to approve our agenda and also our proceedings. So if uh, there's any opposition to accepting the agenda as presented, please raise your hand. I do not see any hands raised. All right, we will consider the agenda accepted by consensus. Uh, we also have the proceedings from our May 2020 meeting uh, have been provided to you in the materials. Are there any modifications to the proceedings? I do not see any hands raised. Right. Is there any opposition to accepting the proceedings as uh, submitted? Raise your hand. I do not see any hands raised. Right. We will consider the proceedings accepted by consensus. Next, we have uh, an opportunity for public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Uh, I want to, you know, we're going to keep this as brief as we can. I know we have two individuals that have uh, stated that they want to speak during this public comment period. Uh, each has been informed that they have three minutes, and so we're going to keep you pretty tight to that so we can get our business done. So uh, raise your hand if uh, you'd like to provide public comment at this time. Identify yourself. We have um, both Bill Zeldek and uh, Steve Catering. Okay, well, Phil, uh, I'll uh, let you go ahead and start with your public comment, and just uh, please keep it to three minutes, sir, if you would. I will. Good afternoon. My name is Phil Zalzak. My remarks are in your email as of noon today. I have four basic questions. What was the actual omega protein harvest at Atlantic Menhaden in the Virginia portion of the Chesapeake Bay in 2019? They were supposed to harvest no more than 51,000 metric tons. However, they ha harvested 66,000 metric tons. That's 31% of the total allowable catch for the entire Atlantic coast of 216,000 metric tons, or 46 times the Maryland harvest of 1,422 metric tons in the Chesapeake Bay. In the past, the mayor protein has been allocated over 110,000 metric tons of Menhaden, over 500 million fish harvested per year. What has been the impact on the commercial harvest of predator fish in Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries? Striped bass, blue fish, and wheat fish are highly dependent on Atlantic Menhaden as a primary source of food and are among 22 other predators 
which forage on Atlantic and Menhaden in the Chesapeake Bay. Over the last 22 years, the commercial harvest in the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries have declined by 34% for striped bass, 76% for bluefish, 98% for weak fish. What are the other significant impacts of the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries? Over the last 20 years, commercial harvesters have declined by 43% in Maryland, 40% in Virginia, and over the last 20 years, four higher trips have declined by 43% in Maryland and 62% in Virginia. The economic damage to the Atlantic Coast commercial and recreational fishing industry is incalculable. However, in 2016, the Atlantic Strife Bass Recreational Fishery alone supported over 100,000 jobs, and the economic impact was $7.7 .7 billion. So what's the solution to over-harvesting the Atlantic Menhaden in the Chesapeake Bay? The Southern Maryland Recreational Fishing Organization Board of Directors has reviewed several proposals submitted by members of this board, Maryland recreational fishermen, Maryland charter captains, and they evaluated the pros and cons of each proposal. Based on their evaluation, they recommend an addendum to the current fishery management plan, which would require one sentence, one, one sentence change. Under Chesapeake Bay reduction fishery cap, the sentence would simply read, Reduction fishing in, is prohibited within the Chesapeake Bay and within the three nautical mile limit of the economic exclusive zone. This proposal was deemed the least disruptive and would have no impact on the current allocation among the states. Science and 22 years of empirical data demand action now as this issue is over 16 years old. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Phil. We appreciate your comments and we appreciate you keeping it uh, within the three minutes. Uh, all right, next we've got Dr. Steve Cabin. Thanks to the chair and the management board for your time. I know you're on a tight schedule. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Steve Cabin. I'm a professor of fisheries oceanography at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth School of Marine Science and Technology. The Science Center for Marine Fisheries asked me to review the CDAR 69 stock assessment of Atlantic Menhaden, including the analysis of ecological reference points, which I think represent a substantial amount of work by the Menhaden Technical Committee and the Ecological Reference Points Working Group. And they offer valuable information for fisheries management. I think the most relevant scientific guidance for the management board was published recently. by Ray Hilborn and his colleagues, the 2017 paper titled, When Does Fish Impact Fish to Predation? In each of these, the management is important. Offer the high variability in the high rate of natural CDR 16 assessment had estimates of natural body from tangle. Steve, Steve, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you're cutting in and out. Uh, sorry about that. That would be my connection. Um, should I proceed? Let's try again, yeah. So the four factors that we have to consider for fishing on forage fish for conserving predators is the high natural variability and the high natural mortality rate. We have a direct estimate of natural mortality, which is better than most assumptions of stock assessment, a weak stock recruit relationship. The fishery does not target um, the juvenile menhaden, which are the primary food source for predators. And the changes in spatial distribution have not been fully addressed in the multi-species model. Uh, therefore, I ask the Menhaden Board to consider the conclusion of Hill Board and his colleagues for Atlantic Menhaden and the likelihood that the impact of the forage fish uh, multi-species model uh, is less than estimated by the model. The impact of fishing on forage fish is less than indicated by the multi-species model. I'd be happy to provide further details in my review and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Dr. Cable. We, we appreciate your, your input. Uh, 
Uh, we also had some materials presented in the supplemental uh, from, from Dr. Cagle for board review. So everybody's had access to those. All right, is there anyone else uh, that would like to make a public comment uh, about anything that's not on the agenda? I do not see any, see any other hands hand raised, Tony? No, I do not see any other right, hands. Very good. Well, that concludes, that concludes our public comment period. There is one housekeeping matter uh, that needs to be attended to, and I'll call on Bob Beal for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to let you know that um, Steve Bowman is having uh, technical difficulties due to the storm. He doesn't have power, doesn't have internet, so he's asked Shanna Madsen to sit in as his meeting-specific proxy for this session. He hopes to be back online tomorrow afternoon, so I just want to let everyone know that, that Steve can't make it and Shanna should be here for the meeting. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for that. We appreciate it. Uh, our next uh, item on the agenda will be a review of the Ecological Reference Point uh, Working Group Analysis. Uh, as everyone remembers, uh, we have asked this group with a formidable challenge, and we have continued to ask them to answer questions about uh, the NWAX MICE model and various scenarios. And so I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Massieri to pre present this uh was also this latest analysis for us so matt it's all yours can you guys hear me yes uh excellent all right hopefully you guys can see my title screen yes excellent um okay uh my name is matt siri uh i'm with the main department of marine resources and I'm also the chair of the Ecological Reference Point Working Group. Um, today we'll be talking about Ecological refer Reference Point Assessment, some additional analysis charged by the board. So just to give you an idea, um, we're first going to go over an introduction, which will probably be a little lengthy. Um, then we'll go into some additional analysis, most of which you guys have seen before. Um, we'll then follow up with some conclusions and recommendations. And then we'll take questions and we'll wrap this puppy up. So the ERP working group back in February um, recommended a combination of the BAM single species model and the NWAX mice model tool to allow managers to evaluate the trade-offs between Atlantic menhaden predator biomass and to establish reference points and quotas for menhaden that, uh, that account for menhaden's role as a forage fish. <clears throat> the ERP working group developed an example <clears throat> ERP target and threshold based on striped bass and where striped bass uh, reference points are, with an ERP target being the maximum F on Menhaden that sustains striped bass at their B target um, when striped bass are fished at their F target, and an ERP threshold being the maximum F on Menhaden that keeps striped bass at their B threshold when they're fished at their F target. <clears throat> in this sort of example scenario, all other ERP species are fished at their 2017 levels in this example. So at that meeting, uh, the Atlantic Menhaden Board tasked us um, with conducting additional runs of the NWAX MICE tool to explore sensitivities um, of the ERPs to different assumptions about ecosystem conditions. And I'm going to go over those again. I believe we saw these during the spring meeting as well. And so, let's see. I tend to talk with my hands. Um, so I'm going to talk with a pointer. So we have a series of scenarios here, um, including our example ERP uh, under se uh, 2017 status quo conditions. Scenario two is all at B target. And as you can see, this is. Um, accomplished by fishing striped bass at its F target, and then the other species at their F targets, all at B threshold with striped bass being fished at its F target and everybody else being fished at their F threshold. And then scenario four would be just to have bluefish and Atlantic herring at their B target. It's important to know, uh, to note here um, that when we say F target, um, an F threshold in this sort of particular example. This is the F that's required to keep these species 
at their target or at their threshold levels, respectively. Just to sort of remind you guys um, of what you know, status quo 2017 conditions really are. Um, at the time, Atlantic herring, for its status, was not experiencing overfishing, was below its target, but not yet overfished. Bluefish were overfishing and overfished. Spiny dogfish were below its F target um, and above its SSB target. And for weak fish, its mortality was too high and its biomass was considered depleted. So putting some numbers on these, um, you know, on each of these examples. So we've dropped scenario four. Scenario four um, was exactly the same as scenario two. Um, and so we have an ERP target and an ERP threshold. So in our example ERPs, the ERP target is 0.19 and an ERP threshold of 0.57. For scenario two, everybody at their B target, the ERP threshold was 0.36 and the, uh, I'm sorry, the ERP target was at 0.36 and the threshold was undefined. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, for scenario three, everybody at their B threshold, the ERP target was uh, 0 0.03 and a threshold of 0 0.32. Now, for comparison purposes, you can look at the single species um, biological reference points with a target of 0 0.31 and a threshold of 0 0.86. So the scenario two, um, what we found was that, you know, Atlantic herring, when they were at their biomass target, and striped bass were fished at their F target, the ERP threshold was undefined, meaning that there wasn't really a menhaden F value um, that we explored that could push by, uh, striped bass to their biomass threshold. And in sort of a graphic representation of what this all looks like. First, let's start off here uh, on this axis with striped bass um, over its uh, biomass over its B target. And so at a ratio, this is a ratio, and so at a ratio of one, striped bass would be at their target. Um, and a little bit below this point, uh, 0 0.8, striped bass would be at its threshold. The example um, here for status quo in the dark line, and you can see that it crosses both the B target and the B threshold. And what you can do is you can sort of drop a line um, from where this line sort of crosses the B target and B threshold dotted lines. And you can end up with, this is Atlantic Menhaden full F. You can end up with the F that would be associated with, um, with that, um, that relationship here. And so as you can see, um, this is our, this is our, um, everybody at status quo, except for, of course, striped bass. When we look at scenario two, where everybody was at their B target, you can see that the line doesn't quite actually make it to the B uh, equals B threshold for striped bass. Um, and this was because Atlantic herring biomass um, just simply didn't allow it to reach that point. You can also see that when everybody was fished at their, uh, when everyone was at their B threshold, um, you could also see that, you know, men hidden, uh, Atlantic men hidden F would be a lot lower if you were to drop a line. So Atlantic herring are an important component of striped bass diets, uh, certainly in some regions and in some seasons. Um, sensitivity analysis indicated that the model may be overestimating the importance of Atlantic herring, however, especially on a coast-wide or an annual level. Um, it was observed that when we looked into this further, um, that the model predicted a higher proportion of Atlantic herring in the diets of striped bass than what we've actually observed in coast-wide studies. And so to explore this a little bit further, we, um, we instituted some seasonal variability sensitivity runs um, in the Atlantic herring and striped bass relationship. This, when we were finished with it, and I won't really bore you with the details, this predicted lower levels of Atlantic herring in the uh, striped bass diets compared to the peer review model um, without seasonality that we showed during the assessment process. Um, but when we did this, we found that the data was more in line with the observed diet data that we see. Um, the sensitivity to Atlantic herring in the NYX mice model, therefore, 
seems to be due to the lack of seasonal and spatial dynamics rather than reflecting realistic ecological dynamics in the system. So I'm going to show you a little bit graphically what this kind of looks like. This is basically the same graph as we looked at before with striped bass B over B target. Um, the target here is a ratio of one. The B to B threshold just below 0.8. Atlantic Menhaden full F here on this axis. And again, in the dark solid line, we have our status quo, uh, uh, the example ERP. Scenario two, the, everybody at their B target here and everybody at their B threshold here. The blue line is the current Menhaden F in 2017. <clears throat> when you add in seasonality, um, I want you to take a look at here we have seasonality. Again, it's the same sort of graph. But what I do want you to notice is that there's three, there's three interesting changes that have happened. The first is, is that all of the scenarios sort of converge, particularly near the B target. Um, the second thing is that the number two, a scenario two, everybody at their status quo, is now the lowest line here. So it's gone from here down to here in relationship. And the second thing is that the entire line, all of the lines have moved up and to the right, meaning that there's a greater distance between the Menhaden F in 2007 and the ecological reference point that would that would come from this, that would be derived from this. However, this was only um, used for explore, uh, exploration. It only accounts for the seasonality between Atlantic herring and striped bass, rather than for all of the predators and prey. And as you can imagine, you would have to institute seasonality, not just between Atlantic herring and striped bass, but between menhaden and striped bass, between menhaden and dogfish, between menhaden and bluefish. Um, so we haven't really fully examined or tested this um, as a working group, uh, but only use this as an exploring, exploratory analysis to look at sensitivity. Um, this really needs to be fully vetted through a peer review process prior to management, particularly because the model seems to be sensitive to assumptions about seasonality. Um, so we need to look at this more for, uh, more in the future, it, probably during our next benchmark for, uh, for this tool. So what conclusions can we draw from this? Um, the ERP working group and the Menhaden TC recommend the examples of ERP uh, scenario one based on status quo uh, 2017 um, F levels for the near-term management of Atlantic Karen. The example ERP is aimed to provide enough menhaden to sustain striped bass, the most sensitive predator in our models, when striped bass are at or near their biomass target under these conditions. The sensitivity to Atlantic herring biomass shown in scenarios two and three are likely due to a lack of seasonal and spatial dynamics rather than reflecting realistic economic dynamics in the system. Um, but this is an uns a source of uncertainty that the board could consider when setting specifications especially given the Atlantic herring are now well below their biomass target, and as you will find out uh, in the next couple of days, pretty far below its threshold as well. Um, so the board could take a look at this or uh, approach this uncertainty kind of in two ways. One would be to apply a buffer to whatever TACs uh, get generated out of this management action, and the other is to adjust the probability of reaching your F target um, and this is based on the risk and, and uncertainty policy working groups um, document that you guys will be reviewing in the next couple of days as well. Um, and so we can get into more of that a little bit later. Again, just to give you an overall summary of what we're talking about here with the, with the example scenario one ERP um, reference points. These were exactly as it was presented as a, at the 2020 winter meeting. We're looking at an F target of about 0 0.19, a threshold of about uh, 0 0.57. Um, the current Menhaden F uh, for 2017 was at 0 0.16, so overfishing um, not occurring. The probability of exceeding the ERP target from 1919 uh, through 2021 at a 216,000 metric ton um, quota 
would range between 60 and 70 percent. The probability of exceeding that ERP threshold would be pretty much zero. So what are the next steps? Um, so we've identified uh, and recommended the example ERP scenario one here. The next steps um, would be to start generating TACs and prob from probabilities um, to reach that ERP, the ERP target. And this would be based on the board's risk tolerance level. You can certainly see how you would maybe want to look at different probabilities of, of achieving that ERPF target and then have a series of TACs that are associated with them. With that, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up and take questions. Um, the, F, the Ecological Reference Point Working Group is a mad group of huge numbers of scientists who have worked on this continuously, not only during the peer review, but in, in afterwards in doing um, some of this additional analysis and additional work requested by the board. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Matt. And, and you know, again, on behalf of the board, we appreciate the work that the group has done. It's been a monumental uh, undertaking, and it's really just the beginning of, of a bold phase, hopefully, in, in fisheries management. And uh, uh, we appreciate you and the others taking the lead on this and uh, moving us down the line towards um, better fisheries management. So with that, uh, I'll open up the floor for questions and just raise your hand and we'll work through you one by one. Fred, um, I just want to see if I can get Connor's voice on here. Connor, can you give it a try right now? Hey, Tony, can you hear me? I can. Okay. So Connor, if you have questions, just text me and then we'll be able to get it in that way. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Connor. Um, so, Spud, you have Lynn with a question. All right, go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Matt, for that. I really appreciate it. I, I, it's interesting to me that when you put those spatial dynamics in for herring um, and striped bass, that those scenarios came in line. But I, my question is really, I just was looking for sort of an affirmation from you and hopefully to help the board. Um, so right now, if the TAC is maintained at 260,000 metric tons, that results in this 60 to 70% probability of exceeding the ERP target over the next couple of years. And so just stated, stated another way, that implies that if the TAC remains the same, then F will rise. Is that correct? That would be correct. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you for that question, Lynn. That's, that's a good clarifying question. Uh, who's next? We have um, <clears throat> Allison Colden and then Emerson Hasbrook. All right. Go ahead, Allison and Emerson, you're on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I just want to echo the chair's uh, comments, thanking the TC and the ERP work group for all the great work they've done. Um, every presentation you give, Matt, I, I learn more and more about the model and, uh, and the dynamics. So this was really a great presentation to learn more about that. Um, I wanted to sort of ask two clarifying questions to make sure I'm understanding things correctly. So related to some of the exploratory runs you guys did, including seasonality, did you say that the ERP target that was gener uh, generated when you included seasonality was more conservative than the ERP um, that's generated when you don't take that into account? So hopefully you can still see my screen. Um, it's actually what it, what ends up actually happening is um, it it would be a little bit less conservative in that regard. Um, there would be a higher Menhaden F that would be associated um, if you were, for example, to if you can see my cursor, if you were to drop a line from here down and compare that to here, 
and down. Okay, great, thanks. And um, while we're there, the other question, and sort of Lynn touched on this a little bit too, it was interesting to see the convergence of those three scenarios. And I'm sort of wondering, is that related to, you know, the conclusion or the observation that the model is most sensitive to striped bass? Um, and that's why they are closer once you sort of uh, address that model artifact of seasonality. It's mostly it's mostly because when you include the seasonality, you drop the importance of of Atlantic herring. Um, and most of these scenarios were built around Atlantic herring, as you can imagine. Um, I'd be really really careful about about making sort of any you know any sort of decisions based around the seasonality component, simply because it just includes the seasonality between Atlantic herring and striped bass, and that's what drives it. It doesn't include you know, we don't know what would happen if you include seasonality, you know, between other predators and other prey in the model. That's something that we need to explore. Great. Thanks, Matt. Hey, Emerson, you're next. Anybody on deck, Tony? No one else has their hand up so far. Uh, okay, um, thank, you. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Dr. Sierra. Um, for your presentation and thanks to the entire working group um, for all their work on this. Um, one of the recommendations that came out of the working group is, is, for the, is that the board may want to consider applying a buffer when setting the tack um, when Atlantic herring are at a low biomass. That's a fairly subjective statement. Was there any discussion about what what the committee meant by low biomass does that mean below their target below their threshold some uh, some other biomass reference number we were just sort of trying to come up with options for the board to take um you know certainly certainly that the status of atlantic herring is an uncertainty within our you know, within this sort of framework, um, simply because it is at a at a very very low level. Um, so, you know, one approach would be to simply, you know, again, because it's an uncertainty, and like any uncertainty, there's sort of there's sort of two ways a board could approach it. One would be to set a precautionary buffer if that's if that's something that the board chose to do. Um, so, while we didn't have anything specific in mind. Um, it is something that you are, of course, always able to, to do when you guys are, are facing an uncertain future. I'll follow up, Mr. Chairman. Follow up? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so then, um, from your answer, then the board would also have the ability, if we, if we chose to, to have a buffer, we would have the ability to discuss what low biomass means. And define that ourselves. Exactly. The, uh, this is this is this is more of an opportunity for you guys. What is what's a low biomass for you? How low does it have to be in order to increase your uncertainty? How big is that uncertainty to you um, that you may wish to account for? Mr. Chairman, you have Justin Davis, Nicola Meserve and Lynn Fagley, and Allison, I'm not sure if your hand is up again or if you forgot to take it down. You forgot to take it down. All right, so we've got Justin, Nicola, and who? Lynn? That's correct. All right, uh, go ahead, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Matt, I, I want to see if I'm understanding correctly, and this will follow up a little bit on Emerson's question. So this, this concept you brought up of having a buffer on the tack to adjust for uncertainty around Atlantic herring, the way I was taking this, um, and maybe I'm not interpreting this correctly, is that the status quo for Atlantic herring under the, the modeling runs that were done reflect a, a population status for Atlantic herring that may not be the case now. They might be at a, a lower biomass than the 2017 situation. And so because they're sort of the other primary prey item here, the board might want to adjust for that probability by, you know, putting that precautionary buffer on the tack. If that's correct, what I'm wondering is, is there any way to provide any sort of mathematical advice on the magnitude of that buffer 
using this modeling framework by doing additional runs under a lower Atlantic herring biomass uh, scenario, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. So we we of course we of course did that. Um, that would be that would be here for everybody at their threshold, um, including Atlantic herring. Um, the the one the one caveat is that we think scenario three and scenario two um, are likely more due to um, the lack of spatial dynamics, right? So in this particular in this particular case, um, you know, we we could take a look at what different buffers might look like, but because we don't have because when we input this into the model, um, the model is sensitive to Atlantic herring. Um, we're we're gonna get we're gonna get results that you know look like the blue or the orange line here, um, depending on where you put Atlantic herring. And so you know this was this was simply put off as a vehicle for the board um, to you know as a way of accounting for uncertainty if they chose to do so. Follow up on that, Justin. You good? I'm good, thank you. That's a good answer. Okay. All right, uh, Nicola, you're next. Uh, Lynn, you're on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Matt. Um, I appreciate the work of the work group and the TC to do these additional analyses to vet the example ERPs, particularly at a time when I'm sure you're all ready to think about something other than Menhaden for a bit. Um, it does seem that it was important that we did take this pause on the motion to the adopt the, to adopt the ERPs to conduct these additional analysis to understand that these particular ERPs um, showed some sensitivity, but they're appropriate for the near term in the words of the work group. Um, and that additional consideration of seasonal and spatial parameters are going to be needed in the future. Um, my question is your definition of the near term. Um, was the work group um, comfortable in the use of these particular ERPs up until the next benchmark, for example, five years away. Thank you. And, and, and to sort of your first, your first point, we will be um, eating, sleeping, and breathing this stuff for quite a while um, okay. beyond this because we, uh, we're, we have a series of scientific papers coming out and most of us are actually bum rushing AFS with a bunch of presentations. Um, so if you're, you know, be looking for that if you attend AFS online this year. Um, having having said that sort of plug, um, to answer your question, yes, we we felt comfortable using these ERPs, the scenario one examples that we presented in February, for near term management until the next benchmark. Um, and in that time, we're going to be working on seasonal and spatial aspects of this model to bring you a better product um, after that benchmark. Okay. All right, Lynn. You got anybody on deck, Connie? No one on deck as of yet. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Hey, you uh, oh, sorry. Uh, John Clark in the queue. Yes, sir. Got gotcha, you, John. Go ahead, uh, Lynn. Thank you. So I really, Justin uh, Davis almost exactly uh, asked my question. I was uh, curious about how to get at this quote unquote precautionary buffer in some um, objective way. And my question is, um, what? how would setting a precautionary buffer differ from applying the risk and uncertainty policy and wouldn't um, wouldn't picking a probability of you know like if we went down to a fifty percent probability of exceeding F, wouldn't holding the fishery at the ERP target, given the uncertainty with herring, wouldn't that provide us more in the near term? Like Nicola said, it seems as though. You know, it seems as though we're, we're taking one step. I'm just curious, really, how we get to that precautionary buffer. Um, and if, if, I guess I'm losing my train of thought. I'm sorry. But I guess I'm confused about the difference between the precautionary buffer and the risk of uncertainty policy. Thank you. 
Sure. And let me see if I can give you an idea of what that might look like. So these lines that, that give you an, a Menhaden full F, those are based on 50% probabilities, right? So what you would, what you would, what you could do, for example, is set your ERP target to be this particular number, which ends up being 0 0.19. That, you know, that produces a quota. That quota has a 50% chance of achieving that F target. You could have a different probability and therefore we get a different um, TAC associated with it. Say, for example, that you wanted a, a 65 or a 70 or an 80% probability of achieving your F target. That would increase, um, I'm sorry, that would decrease that TAC, increasing your probability. The, the opposite is also true. You could choose a 40% chance of achieving your F target. That would give you a higher TAC. That would be one way of actually um, accounting for some of this uncertainty is to say, for example, that you want to that you want to you want to have a higher probability of achieving your F target um, when Atlantic herring are at a low biomass, say for example, at or below its threshold. Um, so that's one approach. The other approach would be to use the 50% probability or some other probability, and then say because Atlantic herring are in um, a not such a good place, we want to add a precautionary buffer of X percentage, just because, um, on more of an ad hoc basis. Does that make sense, the differences between the two? Yes, that was excellent, thank you. Thank you, thank you for that question, Lynn, thank you for that. All right, John Clark. Still have John. Hello. I think we can hear Hello? you, John. Oh, you can. Okay, you can hear. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the presentation, Matt, and all the great work the uh, uh, Earth Work Group has done. I'm just curious. Something you said earlier in response to a question: putting the seasonality in there for land airing. Uh, increased F on Menhaden. Were those the only two species in the model that are actually prey? So lowering the uh, importance of one would automatically raise the other. Oh, I'm actually I was muted. My bad. Um, so to answer your question, generally for the most part. Right. I mean, you only have two prey items in this particular model. Um, the the difficulty here is um, the the seasonality component is only between Atlantic herring and striped bass. You may get different results when you put in seasonality between Menhaden and striped bass. Um, and so we don't know what that's going to look like until we try it. Um, but you know, putting seasonality in, determining what magnitude it is. Um, and other aspects along with that are a lot of work um, and not something that we can do in any short, reasonable amount of time. And even if we were able to do it, um, it does probably going to require a peer review. Um, but to answer your question, you know, more completely, yes, that's that's pretty much how it works um, in which you you sort of shift um, striped bass predation um, off of Atlantic herring and more than likely on to menhaden. Um, with again one caveat, if you do that for all of the species, you may get very different results. Okay, Matt, this is sorry, this is Katie. I was just going to add to that to say there actually are a couple of other prey species in there. We do have uh, bay anchovy, and then we also have sort of general other prey uh, in there as well. But I think the um, the overall concept is yeah, there's there's um, limited amounts of place for some of that predation or that natural mortality to go and to come from. And so that's certainly a consideration. Thanks, Katie. The more important to... John, you're breaking up again on us. Daddy, 
was obviously it's like we've lost John. John, we can't hear you. We, you broke up and then we lost you. So, all right, well, maybe we can get him back. Anybody else in the queue for questions, Tony? No one that I saw. I, um, Nicola and Liz's hands were raised, but I put them down because I think they were from before. So, okay. um, all right. Well, let's, uh, we'll conclude our. Our uh, question and answer period. Again, thank you, Matt, for the presentation and, and thanks to all for going in the work group. We, we do appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate you being with us and your answers will certainly help uh, us all understand better uh, what we're trying to accomplish here. So we've got uh, about 11 minutes left on our allotted time. Uh, what I wanted to do with the remaining time is put up the two postponed motions. Uh, that are for us to consider at this meeting, uh, just so we can read them once again. Um, we'll make sure that we're clear, uh, understanding what those motions do. Uh, those motions, we don't need any action by the by the board to bring them forward for consideration. Uh, they were postponed, not tabled, so uh, they are live motions. Um, just want to make make it clear to everyone that. No management action further than approval by this board at this meeting is necessary to adopt these motions. It doesn't require an addendum, doesn't require an amendment. Uh, amendment three authorized us to adopt ecological reference points. Uh, so we're, we're clear there from a procedural standpoint. Uh, can we get those motions up where everybody can see them? There we go. That's the first one. So if you notice in there, it does not have a number. There is not a number in these motions. You know, it, it, it basically refers to a process and we have had recommended to us a scenario uh, with associated numbers. Now, uh, I don't want to get into deliberations about these motions in our remaining time. Uh, what I wanted to do is ask the uh, Kirby, uh, if he's got enough time to give us a summary of the public, the very extensive public comment we have received uh, related to this this issue. So, uh, Kirby, are you ready to do that? Yes, sir. Just need to get um, presentation up. All right, looks like Maya's got it now. Great. Um, so, we'll just switch over to the next slide. And um, so, I just wanted to. Uh, offer up uh, a brief summary. Um, leading up to this week's meeting, we received a lot of public comment on the postponed motion. Based on when it was received, these comments were included in briefing materials, supplemental materials, and additional supplemental materials that were sent out last Friday. While you all have had the ability to review these comments, given the volume of them, um, I provided a brief summary, just a general breakdown of some of the numbers. So, in terms of organizations, we received 16 letters from organizations that in many instances had co-signing organizations. So in combination, there were over 100 organizations that had endorsed or co-signed on public comments that we received. Regarding form letters, we received at least three different types of form letters from three different organizations. And in total, we received over 1,000 uh, respondents. And in terms of individual comments uh, in the form of email, we received over 200 comments from individuals. So in terms of those comments, an overwhelming majority of the public comment indicated support for the board approving ERPs to manage Atlantic Menhaden. Most of the public comment did not define the ERPs that should be implemented. Comments highlighted a range of predators from whales to birds that benefit from Menhaden's role as an important forage species and adopting ERPs for management would help ensure enough fish are left in the water for these predators. That being said, there were many comments that specified that the board should adopt ERPs defined such that it allows striped bass to rebuild to its biomass target. In speaking to either general or specific ERP's definition, the board should adopt 
Many commenters also noted the importance of Menhaden to coastal economies, businesses that rely on the water, and in particular, recreational anglers and supporting industries. So that's just a, a summary of some of the comments uh, we've received that you all um, should have been able to review through the materials we've provided. Uh, so that that's, concludes my presentation, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Kirby. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, th these comments have come in after we have received uh, numerous comments as we've been going through this process for the last several years. So obviously there is strong support in the public for adopting ecological reference points moving forward uh, with a paradigm shift in management, uh, the way that we've been hopefully working towards. Um, are there any questions about the postponed motions about them themselves or about comment. Uh, at this point, I'll, we can uh, ask those questions. Uh, if not, uh, what I would like to do is recess. We will reconvene tomorrow at 2.45 p.m. And at that point, I'm going to allow some public comment about the postponed motions and uh, open up the floor for discussion and deliberation on the postponed motions. And then we will move, you know, after we make a decision, we will move into the next agenda item, which is going to be dealing with uh, the timing and the task of setting the 2021-22 fisheries specifications on our receiver presentation on that. Uh, we've already had some preparatory questions sort of leading us in that direction. And then we'll also uh, be electing a vice chair. So. Are there any questions about the motions? Uh, we divided this meeting into two parts because uh, I wanted to give everybody a chance to think about the presentation from Matt and have an opportunity to caucus amongst the delegations, have some time to reflect on this so that when we reconvene tomorrow, everybody will be prepared uh, to go into decision-making mode. We've been deliberating on this for a long time, and now we come to the point of we need, we need to make a decision. So, any questions or, or comments from the board uh, at this point? If Emer excuse me, Emerson Hasbrook. Go ahead, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a comment on uh, the public comments. And I think as we go forward here, the board has some responsibility to manage expectations. Um, I haven't read all of the public, public comment, but I've looked at a lot of it. And I think there, there, there's a lot of, a lot of those commenters. So a lot of the, a lot of the public perceives adopting ERPs as a panacea. Um, that by adopting ERPs, we're going to save the striped bass, save the bluefish, save the weak fish, save the whales, save the birds, save other wildlife. And that's not what this is. It's not a panacea that's going to fix everything for all species. So I think we need, as a board, to try to manage those expectations. Thank you. Thank you, Emerson. And I certainly uh, appreciate and agree with those comments. Uh, it's easy to think that this will fix all the woes of, of fishery management. But the reality is, and we all know this, that uh, you know we're not going to create ecological reference points that's going to bring weak fish back to you know healthy condition. Uh, you can't you can't bring back striped bass without controlling fishing mortality directly on striped bass. So there, there's a lot, but I, I appreciate that you, you saying that on the record because I do think it is important for us to manage those expectations to be realistic. Any other uh, questions or comments? Any hands raised, Tony? Hold on one sec. I was just unmuting a commissioner that we had lost before. I have Adam Nowalski. Go ahead, Adam. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so as I think about where we were at the last meeting, the task we sent the TC back to do and what they've come back with us, I'm left with the sense that the best available science the PC is comfortable putting forward would basically define ERPs at the present time as 
limiting to bluefish, striped bass, herring, and menhaden. So I'm wondering if one, if that is a fair assessment, and two, if there was some guidance from leadership and or staff to think about over the next 24 hours about if there would be some way to move forward with ERPs, but classifying them at this time just as such, only to include striped bass, bluefish, herring, and menhaden, since that's what it seems the advice we're being given is. So I appreciate feedback on that. If my characteristic of what the ERP was being recommended is accurate, and if there was a way forward that they could be defined as such for the time being. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, I guess I would, if Matt, you're still on here, I would sort of bounce that question back to you because the current the current motions basically specify the the relationship between men and striped bass. And, and not necessarily, they don't mention specifically bluefish and herring. So, uh, is that something you feel comfortable addressing, Matt? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's important to note that, um, the NWAX mice model was built around those particular species, um, in particular for striped bass, because striped bass is the most sensitive one in the model. Um, as, you know, as Adam, I'm sure knows, we ran the we ran the full NWAX model off the north uh, from the northeast shelf, um, and um, I actually do have a slide, but uh, I don't I don't have access um, to you guys anymore. Um, what it what it shows is is that striped bass were the most striped bass and birds were the most sensitive in the full model. Um, however, um, the idea always has been behind this is that you know, reference points that are based around striped bass are likely to cover all of those other species, um, given that they're less sensitive to changes in menhaden um, than, um, you know, so that's been, that's been the whole push behind using um, a less complex intermediate complexity approach. Um, because including something like um, all of the, the full NWAX model for, for everything, just becomes way too cumbersome uh, for management purposes. Um, and so basically setting this up for striped bass will set you up for all the other species involved, given that striped bass are the most sensitive. Thank you, Matt. Does that answer your question, Adam? Uh, I, I guess so. I guess then the takeaway from that and with the motions as they're before us, I guess the takeaway is that if we wanted to define the ERP to include the four species I've mentioned, that would require modifications to these motions uh, because right now the motion is specific to the F target or the threshold depending on the motion for only menhaden and striped bass and just keeps, but does keep everything else status quo with everything else not being limited to bluefish and herring. We, we would include all of those things. But one potential option, I guess, could be uh, to modify the second part of both of these motions that say, all other ERP species is defined in the NREX mice model. Could it could we consider and menhe and bluefish and herring as defined in the NREX mice model? I mean, could could the model run only on those species? Uh, I guess my my, con my my concern here is that with the second part. We've gone far down the road here. I think the expectation uh, is that we continue to move forward with it. And I think what our challenge is, is to find the right intermediate step. I think this brief step back we took momentarily, I'm not sure it was a step back. Maybe we were just building a stronger step or figuring out how to design the next step. I think what it provided us with is definitive information that we're definitely not 
ready to move forward with ERPs based on a large number of other species. Uh, and we definitely have to define the scope of what those species are that we think the science can provide a reasonable level of information to us as managers to make a decision that we think, one, we can justify to the public, and two, we think realistically is going to provide a tangible outcome uh, in line with our management decision. So, so I think that's what I'm looking for. I have concerns that this element of these motions, all other ERP species, I'm not sure the rest of that, and I'll be trying to get some information about what the middle ground might look like for consideration in the next 24 hours. Um, again, we're we're four minutes over, so I've got to got to be judicious with the time we have. I don't want to impinge on Sprint Mass, but is there is there anything, Matt, that you can add that you haven't already said to maybe address what he's picking? If not, then fine, and we can continue this discussion tomorrow when we reconvene. Yeah, just just that we built we built the ER the ERP examples based around Stripe based around striped bass, their targets and their re and their thresholds, simply because they were the most sensitive within the model. And so, um, yeah, by by doing things to striped bass, you sort of in, you do end up being you know precautionary for the other species in the model. Thank you, thank you, Matt, and thank you for that question, Adam. And we can certainly vary this discussion. Uh, for tomorrow when we reconvene uh, at 2.45. Uh, hopefully the weather system will be moved up farther to the north away from us. Uh, at this point, I'm going to recess the board uh, until we reconvene tomorrow at 2.45 p.m. Thanks again, everyone, uh, for being here. I assume Tony will start the striped bass board uh, second session on time. Yes, we will start it at 3 p.m. Thank you.